professors and university employees of Reddit. What behind-the-scenes campus drama went on that students never knew about? In our chemistry department a few years back, a grad student who was failing started poisoning another graduate student they worked with closely by putting carcinogens in their food and drinks. Colorless, odorless, flavorless, thanks to his chemistry knowledge. He eventually was caught, and I'm not sure what happened to him. Thrown out for sure, perhaps arrested. Another year, a grad student pushed another student down a flight of steps to try to end their life. Chemists are crazy. Story 2. A professor was hired to start a research center slash institute, got paid a lot of money and came in with tenure. He was frickin' weird to begin with, but as time went on it became apparent that he wasted all of the funds intended for starting the center. Nothing was happening but the accounts were diminishing. The whistleblower hotline was provided with a bunch of data that strongly suggested he was funneling a lot of that money to a company owned in part by his brother, in addition to a lot of blatant and casual misuse of funds, buying personal and convenience stuff for himself and his staff. Things started heating up and they called him in for hearing about it. The very next day we found an indignant letter, announcing his resignation and accusing the entire department and college of unethical behavior slipped under the door. He skipped out in the middle of the night, leaving a big pile of deliberately damaged equipment in his office. The university didn't pursue him. I believe it was because they were in the middle of a scandal involving faculty and students in another department and just didn't want to hear about it. Students were completely unaware. Story 3. I was a professional assistant to the Italian department, and one of my favorite professors did a showing of a very famous Italian film, Swept Away, on a weekend. This was an outside-of-class activity which no one was required to attend, at a college with college-age students. Just a, we don't have time to watch this in class, so we'll watch it over the weekend in the auditorium. The movie in question would be considered uh, controversial by American standards, but by Italian film standards, it is also controversial, but considered a pretty important film for anyone studying film. It deals with some pretty intense issues involving dynamics between men and women, wealthy and poor, as well as, depending on your interpretation, an assault scene. I was working in the department when we did this movie showing, and so I got a front row view of it blowing up. Apparently, some freshmen who are 18 years old attended the screening and complained to their parents who complained to the school. The school decided the best option was to fire my professor. The Italian department went to bat for him, reminding the school that adult students attended that screening voluntarily. The school knew they couldn't get away with firing him specifically for that, so at the end of the quarter, they revoked his contract renewal. He was supposed to come back the next year, citing, Lifestyle choices that conflict with university standards. Dumb move. I don't know who on the university's legal team wrote it that way, but they should be fired. The professor in question was Pakistani and openly gay, living with his husband. As far as I understand it, he took their asses to court for discriminatory dismissal. They settled out of court for an unknown sum, but it was enough that my professor and his husband moved out to Italy, where he now works at a university there and is very happy. No one outside of the Italian department knew what happened. Professor was there one quarter and gone the next with no warning whatsoever. Ooh, of all the ways to try to get rid of a professor, this was one of the worst ideas. What awful, awful phrasing in this circumstance. I fully believe they didn't intend for this, but they also were gonna fire him over something stupid anyway, so well deserved. Story 4. Our heads of department or course directors would purposely keep dragging students. The act of pulling a student through their studies, even though they would fail most classes. They'd purposely grade the student just above a pass even though the content of the work was astonishingly bad, because if they left or dropped out, it would look bad on the course's stats and dropout rate, not to mention the university not getting the student loan money. From there, of course, statistics would be ridiculously high for that particular degree, so they They'd then sell this to prospective students and parents. This is currently still going on. Source. I'm a lecturer at a university, and yes, it disgusts me. Story 5. My professor for grad school had his lab raided by the FBI. This happened long before I joined. Apparently one of his first or second classes of grad students in the 80s or 90s decided they wanted to use the lab resources to brew some drugs. Very easy to do with the equipment we have. From what I was told, this student would stay late in lab after others had left to get this done. In Breaking Bad style, he fences his drugs to some distributor and thought that was the end of it. The purity of his drugs was enough that they were able to trace it back from the streets to him and the lab. A sting operation shut down the lab while the dust settled, and my professor was cleared of all wrongdoing, since none of this was under his direct control, and all campus resources were being misused by the student. State Intelligence Bureau told the professor that it was the largest and purest operation they'd seen in the state at the time. Alright, good to know. If I want to cook some ice, then I gotta make it pretty bad. That way they can't find me. Right? That's what I'm getting from this, right? That's the lesson here. Story 9. I think students would be surprised at just how much drama happens. I'm talking everything from major drama like lawsuits that universities have kept quiet, or EO complaints, to colleagues complaining at each other because one thought the other rolled her eyes at the other. 
I just went to a faculty meeting that was so tense and angry, I legitimately wanted to leave the room, and it was over a small wording difference of opinion in a policy that literally doesn't matter, because it is departmental and not university-wide, so it's gonna get struck down anyway. Anyway, sometimes I'm happy to go to class or meet with students in my office because that is the fun part of the job, and usually drama-free, until the last week of classes when everyone starts hustling for a higher grade. Story 7. I worked at a large university, and right before I started, the longtime dean of the school went on sabbatical. I didn't think anything of it until two months later, when I found out the university forced him to take time off because he blew almost all of the school's budget on fancy dinners with donors. We're talking like a thousand dollars plus on alcohol-heavy meals. Showed up to official university events high off of coke, and kept a second admin assistant essentially as a, uh, intimate slave. He had a private bathroom with a shower installed in his office. He sent the school into a major budget crisis and was a PR disaster waiting to happen. It was a huge mess. The acting dean who stepped in got a lot of crap for how much damage control she had to do. Ultimately, he returned a few years later just as a part-time faculty member, but still totally wild. Story 8. When I was 22, 25 now, I worked at a community college chemistry lab. We handled all the chemicals and equipment that were used for the labs. Just a general chemistry 1 and 2 and organic chemistry 1 and 2. Nothing too dangerous. We did, however, have a small cabinet full of chemical reagents that were technically too dangerous for me to handle. When those needed to be used, it had to be my boss who handled them. I technically think I wasn't even allowed to be in the room. Those were the rules, but the reality was my boss was a mess. She was often, and I mean most of the time, too busy dealing with issues from her personal life to do her job. There were countless times when she just wasn't around, and I had to make important decisions by the seat of my pants. She constantly had me doing things that I wasn't supposed to be doing, like boiling down solutions of sulfuric acid to increase the concentration. Part of the reason she was such a mess was that she was already in trouble at work because she was caught having student employees do things they shouldn't have been doing. Anyway, one day after classes were done, we needed to set up an experiment that required us to handle pure, lab-grade, nothing is ever truly pure, diatomic bromine. Not only was I not supposed to handle that reagent, but it was probably the most dangerous thing we had, at least according to my boss. She was busy on the phone with her ex-husband or something, and insisted it was no big deal and that I should just do it myself. She's my boss, so I don't argue. Well, I end up dropping a 1-2 to two liter bottle of bromine. It shatters. Dark, brown liquid spreads across the floor, and red bromine vapor immediately starts to fill the room. I get out of there as fast as possible, but I'm already seeing stars, and feel as though I might faint by the time I get to our office, which is just down the hall. I truly cannot describe the feeling of having bromine vapor in your lungs, but it's frickin' bad. Without me even saying anything, she knows what's happened. The smell is unmistakable, my clothes were stained, and she probably heard the bottle shatter. She rushes to the lab. I realize I need to wash the stuff off me immediately, so I run to the shower we have in the spare lab room that we use for storage. I rinsed for probably 20 minutes, stark frickin' naked, mind you, letting the water wash over my open eyes the entire time. I'm gonna cut it off there, but long story short, she got put on immediate suspension and never returned to work. No students ever found out what had happened. I often hung out with other students while I was working when the faculty weren't around. Any one of them could have easily been in the wrong place at the wrong time and suffocated in that room before help arrived. There's more to the story, obviously, but I'm getting tired of typing this out and it's spring break. So I'm gonna take a nap. I'll finish it up later. Edit. Here's the rest. Emergency services arrived. After I finished washing, I got into a bunny suit, went outside, and smoked a cigarette to calm my nerves. I thought I was going to be fired, for sure, maybe even get in a legal trouble. Even though it hurts, I huffed that thing down, almost passed out again. I just sit outside for what felt like half an hour, but was probably five to ten minutes. Eventually, a paramedic comes outside, sees me, and starts to say some stuff over the radio. She runs over to me, asks me a bunch of questions that basically boil down to, Are you okay? I wasn't really listening and just told her that I felt fine for the most part. Campus PD asked me some questions about what had happened. Again, I thought I was in trouble, so I kept it comically vague, making sure not to say who did what. To my surprise, they were just like, Alright, hope you're okay. I refused medical care one more time and decided to just leave before my boss, her boss, or someone in the administration could find me. After I get home, my boss starts texting me non-stop. She's trying to coach me on what to say when I talk to the higher-ups or any regulatory body, but in a veiled way, making sure to phrase everything in such a way as to make me feel responsible for the whole thing. I had known her long enough to see through her BS, and started to realize that she was the one who was going to be in trouble, not me. 
and now she's trying to cover her butt. I didn't reply to a thing she sent. I went into work the next day, and my boss's boss, I'll call her M, is seated in the office. She tells me we need to have a short conversation about what happened. I asked where my boss, let's call her B, was. She says that she is suspended until this gets sorted out. I tell her what went down, just like I told all of y'all. I then show her the text messages that my boss sent me. She gets wide-eyed as hell, asking me to take screenshots and send them to her, which I do. All labs get cancelled for a couple of weeks until they can find a replacement. At some point, a few weeks after the incident, there's a hearing with the president of the college, the dean of the science department, some union reps, and of course, my boss. I basically told them what I had told M. B tried to interrupt me to contradict what I was saying several times and stared daggers at me the whole time I was speaking. No one had any patience for her crap, though, and eventually she just realized she was digging a bigger and bigger hole for herself. After I'm done, they tell me I can go, and that's pretty much that. I signed something that pretty much said I wouldn't sue in exchange for getting to keep my job and some hush money. They made it very clear that they could fire me if they wanted to, but I think this was mostly intimidation. I heard later that the smoking gun that got my boss fired were the texts she sent me. Upon close examination, it became clear that she was formulating a story that absolved her of guilt as she was texting me. The thing that tipped them off was the story changing towards the end in critical ways. Probably she realized that there were extremely few circumstances, maybe even none at all, in which she wasn't responsible for everything. Story 9. Graduate students are treated like trash. We are cheap labor, so the tenured professors can keep publishing without doing anything, and the professors looking for tenure can get the publications they need. Basically, the entire publish or perish culture in academia is really toxic. Unless you get lucky with a nice advisor, you're screwed. Also, university administration cares nothing for graduate students. At my school, our president announced a cash appreciation gift to every staff person making under a certain amount. Every graduate student on campus thought that included us as well, because, well, to every logical person, we're staff eligible for benefits and work full-time. Nope, we're only students when it's convenient for the university and makes their numbers look good and considered staff only because we're getting paid barely above the poverty line. At least I got health insurance. Story 10. Academia sometimes draws ridiculous people. I had a dean once who caused so much turmoil so often by simply denying objective reality when it didn't suit her. I remember spearheading a project to repurpose a section of our building. I got the plans and she refused to believe the blueprints on square footage, so I measured it myself. She pretended it wasn't the case. It wasn't large enough to accommodate its new purpose, but according to her, it was, because in her mind it was 30% larger. I went over her head and ended up in meetings with higher administration trying to get them to understand. They all took her side. She proceeded to make my life hell for the remainder of my time at the university. I need to know, how do you take her side here? How is that even possible? She's just mistaken. Like, there is a number that is true, and she believed it was not. I'm confused, man. Story 11. I worked for the maintenance department one summer while in college, and got exposed to a lot of the drama in that department. Highlights include the school deciding that they didn't want to deal with the union anymore, so they started hiring for all non-teaching positions as temps, then firing them after six months and rehiring them 30 days later. This was done because temps didn't have to be union, and also because once a large enough percentage of employees were non-union, they could start hiring non-union employees on a permanent basis. And the entire third shift cleaning crew, except the team lead, was made up of people with disciplinary issues. This included a man who's been caught multiple times stealing panties and setting up cameras in the girls' showers. At least once, the girl in question was underage. None of this was ever told to the students. The head of facilities and planning knew this was an issue and just did checks on all the bathrooms in the building this guy cleaned once or twice a month. How is there no better suited candidate for this job? Like, if this is your best candidate, just raise the pay you're giving them, please. What is wrong with you? Why put this man in a situation where he can do exactly what he did again? Gross. Story 12. Was on a grand jury. One of the deans of a community college was finance officer for some kind of club campus organization. The organization was mothballed, but for some reason they never closed out the bank account associated with it. She eventually became the preparer and approver for that account, and quickly went about paying her condo fees with money that was still being directed to the account. I don't recall why it was still being replenished. She also gave one of her relatives a no-show job tutoring students paid out of the account, and they ended up splitting the salary. We sent that one off to trial. She was screwed. Story 13. Two professors in my department had been best of friends for over a decade, and had a huge personal falling out. They couldn't even be in the same room together, which made department meetings awkward or impossible. Both started recruiting allies in the department, and basically split it down the middle. It got so bad that a committee of faculty from other departments was convened to interview every faculty member member and decide the fate of the department. One of the proposed options was shutting down the entire major. I had tenure at the time, 
but tenure does not protect you if your department no longer exists. There is a loophole in the rules that states that if you have tenure and your department dissolves, you can keep your job if another department will absorb you. I met with three other departments and all three agreed to absorb me if I was cut loose. I was the debate coach, so departments were willing to absorb me to keep the debate team running. Most of my colleagues did not have that leverage. Once 90% of the faculty realized the possibility of joblessness, everybody decided to play nice. Good to know that even people with PhDs working at universities can be like this. There is no level of book smarts that can make you navigate personal relationships better. That stuff's hard, man. That stuff's hard. Story 14. Probably a bit late, but I have a big one. By the way, not me. But Fiancé is an oil painting professor at the arts department of a university. So for this year's Women's Day, the program director, PD, wanted to do something regarding harassment slash abuse of female students in universities. To do so, she got into some research about the issue and came across an article from Vice with anonymous stories. In it, there was one from a girl who posed for a professor. This is an art department, so it's not surprising that many students work as drawing models in atelier slash private sessions. Nothing frisky in nature about it. Right after the drawing session ended, Professor asked the girl for an extra hour, and if she could possibly pose with legs spread, as he was working on a project about female genitalia. Girl agreed, as this man was seen as the most respected professor of the department. In the middle of the extra hour, Professor, from now on, P.O.S., grabbed her by the legs and proceeded to force her into oral. Girl fights back, P.O.S. backs off, she leaves and never reports it. P.D. immediately recalled an exposition P.O.S. had done the previous year with drawings of female genitalia. She got suspicious and decided to confront P.O.S. P.O.S. admits he did it, but refuses to reveal the girl's identity. P.D. needs it to fill out the report and have P.O.S. fired. At this moment, P.D. consults the situation with the dean and both decide to talk about the other six drawing slash painting professors, as they might know regular students that posed for P.O.S. P.D. and dean talk to the other professors, and one of them recalls one student. Let's call her S. She's close to him and mentioned several times that she posed for him on a weekly basis. With this info, PD calls S to her office and asks her if there's something she wants to share regarding assault at the university. She says it's a routine, random, and anonymous poll they do every semester. Now mind that PD is the kind of person who will fight like an angry dog to protect her students. So S bursts into tears and ends up telling her everything about the incident. Now, POS got fired and nobody knows why. Everyone thinks he retired because of a health thing, except for PD, Dean, and the drawing slash painting professors. As the priority for PD is to protect S's identity and prevent any kind of retaliation or harassment against her. So yeah, the most respected professor at the department turned out to be an assaulter. On a less dramatic issue, students are using the darkroom, photography, to bang, and are convinced professors and assistants don't have a clue. Story 15. Research fellow at University of Exeter here, UK. We recently had all our office bins removed as part of a new policy to try and improve recycling. Got lots of mass emails replying with tons of sass and annoyance. One professor just replied, What's next? Do you expect us to drive to the local skip? To be honest, it just was really annoying not having a bin in our shared office. The worst part is now everyone brings in their own plastic bags to use as a temporary bin for the day, and then we end up having a ton of people trying to get them into one bin that is shared by the floor. My North American butt took a second to realize what bin meant here. Trash cans. They got rid of trash cans? to try to encourage recycling? Like some kind of garbage prohibition? Surely they didn't think this would work, right? Story 16. Our Dean of Students was a really fun, charismatic guy. Everyone loved him because he would do awesome speeches at orientation and was super energetic and nice to anyone he met on the street. Literally, no one had anything bad to say about this dude. Turns out he's semi-secretly a raging alcoholic. There was a few month period where he straight up disappeared off the face of the planet during the middle of summer, prime orientation period. He missed a bunch of orientations and the director of orientation did his speeches for him. She was not a good orator. Then rumor went around that he was secretly an alcoholic and the school forced him to go to rehab or he would be fired. They kept it real hush-hush too, because this dude has such a pristine reputation among the current students, there could have easily been a revolt over his firing. Story 17. PhD student here. My department spearheaded an effort to get our previous dean of the college ousted with a vote of no confidence. She resigned shortly before the vote could take place, so she wouldn't have that in her work history. The new dean demanded a sky-high salary to come here, and after arriving did an $80,000 renovation of his office suite. It happens to be next door to my lab, and we all think he's a jerk because he hates that we, a working research laboratory, make noise. He's come over to yell at us for interrupting his meetings before. Also, my university tried to change the way that graduate students are funded in 
a way that would have removed a lot of students' tuition remission. They tried to do this secretly so no one would have time to raise hell, but one of the professors thwarted them by directly emailing the information he got to the Graduate Student Council. We bombarded the administration with lots and lots of pushback, and they halted the policy change. This is the same professor that threw a friend in the Title IX office, we know has called out and shut down the administration during meetings when they try to make jokes that call grad students lazy, greedy, replaceable, etc. Story 18. I saw a teacher almost in tears, because the student reps on the budget committee wanted to save several thousands of dollars a year by discontinuing the delivery of mountain spring water to the faculty buildings that had drinking fountains during a budget crisis. That same teacher was one of the ones in support of discontinuing the local bus service to the school, which was a way outside of the city it primarily served, and was the cheapest college for more than half a state and served a lot of lower-income students who relied on the bus. She was also in support of closing the cafeteria because, and I quote, I don't even eat there. Red-faced and emotionally distraught by the suggestion that a single luxury faculty service was maybe unnecessary. In case any of you were curious where all that tuition money goes. Story 19. Our last provost was on an interim basis, after a quick succession of two others that had been hired slash fired. I assumed they wanted to take some time naming the next provost because it's a big commitment. Provost search committee is formed, and every criteria is aimed at naming the interim as the permanent provost. This is the second highest position in the university after the president. Interim provost, IP, is in the job for months and is in charge of a huge university-wide development plan. Seriously, the plan that is going to guide our path for at least the next 10 years, probably more. Millions, possibly billions of dollars will go into this plan that is being sold as the future of making our university a top-tier research institution. IP is sent around the country to sell this plan to alumni and donors. He talks a big game and makes it sound like he has dedicated his entire life and career into the university. Just as this development plan is going to the regents for a vote, IP is confronted on the steps of the admin building by the husband of one of the women who works in his office. IP and the woman had been having an affair, while they're both married to other people. One of my colleagues had seen them at the airport together, but didn't think anything of it since they're both in very top positions, and could have easily been traveling together on university business, but eh, yeah. They were just about to announce that he had a permanent position, vote on the new development plan, and his mistress's husband fought him on the steps of a building in the middle of campus in the middle of the day. He resigned to, and I quote, spend more time in prayerful reflection with his family. I'm sure there are plenty of people who know about this, but most students just wouldn't have cared. The university wants to do everything they can to keep it quiet because we have a reputation to maintain. Story 20. Someone poured radioactive material down a sink. Two staff members were caught banging. A guy secretly converted a storeroom into a home for himself, complete with bed, furnishings, and a fully plumbed-in shower and toilet. No one noticed until long after he'd left. An office remained sealed from the 1970s until the early 2000s. It was literally forgotten about, and the door had been painted over. When it was discovered, it was like opening a time capsule. There was a bomb threat on campus, and security forgot about a whole building full of people and didn't evacuate them. Luckily, the threat was fake. Most of the senior staff in the finance division were made redundant to save money, without anyone making sure they knew how to run things without them. Turns out, no one knew how loads of things worked, and they had to rehire them as consultants, at considerably more than what they'd been paid originally. Speaking of paying people, finance once forgot about a public holiday, and didn't put the payroll through in time, meaning no one got paid. People missed loan repayments and defaulted on their mortgages. How do you convert a storeroom into a living area with a shower and toilet. Like, bro, I am just impressed. Hats off to you, sir. Story 21. Not sure how other unis are set up, but at mine, there are three branches. Academics, professional staff, and the leadership. Leadership at present gets way too into micromanagement, leading to wasted funds, screwed up workloads, and hastily executed pet projects. Academics are dumb. They're quite intelligent, but their blinders are on to anything outside of their field of expertise. Sometimes to the point where I wonder how they haven't just ended their own lives by accident. It means they're a hell of a client to work with as they know they're intelligent, but aren't empathetic to the fact that they don't know everything. I have seen millions of dollars wasted, mostly on marketing poorly. Marketing teams have almost no ROI targets, and if you work at a good uni, these spots will fill up regardless, so they'll make the AdWord campaigns worth tens of thousands easily. From what I've seen, very few are hooked into Google Analytics, so basically you can't track users coming in from those ads. No learnings, no identifying what your campaign is affecting, just that it's been clicked. I've seen a senior person get sold snake oil systems to use. Half a million dollars later, it's revealed it's useless for our uni. This would have been solved with a conversation with a worker in the field, but this guy forged ahead alone. 
Generally, there's a lot of wasted cash on frivolous BS. Students complain about three key things every year, but the uni seems to ignore it and keep funneling money into other garbage. New builds, new pet projects, etc. My advice to students is, it's all a ripoff. Unless you want to be an academic, ensure you get low fees for uni, and get into a field that recognizes ability over institution. There's one point that I really, really agree with here, and it's that the smartest people are sometimes the dumbest. When you are really intelligent and have proof such as a PhD, it's easy to forget what you don't know. And while I'm saying, I get it, I'm also saying, it's still stupid. I think true intelligence is recognizing what you don't know, and the fact that there will always be stuff you don't know. Quite simply, you can't know everything. That is too much knowledge for one person. If I were to say, being a genius is truly just always being willing to learn. And then also some other things, because genius is a pretty prestigious title. But that's the gist of it for me. Anyway, there you go. Behind the scenes drama at universities. A lot of money gets wasted. What a surprise. I couldn't have seen that one coming. Anyway, that is all the stories we have for today, so thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are, and I will see you in the next one.